We're streaming, okay. Nice. So we got the stream going. Hello, Spot of Tea, how are you doing? Uh, let me do my little intro um, to this video, to the live streams, the way we're doing them right now. So those of you who are attending this live stream, thank you very much for coming, uh, making the time to be here. For those of you that are gonna be watching this video on another platform, uh, the recorded version, we're gonna begin sort of the the story get into the get into it all in about 10 minutes after a little bit of introductions and greetings and stuff like this and uh, what I'll do when I load up the video to whatever platform it is that you're watching it when it's recorded I'll provide a sort of a timestamp in the description of this video to when we're going to start into talking about uh, mermaid publications and that was a comic book company that I had and that one of the comic book titles that we ended up uh, publishing right and uh, just so you know as always as before anything that i sort of reference uh, in this in this video i'll try to provide links in the description of the videos as well if you're watching this recorded and if um, if anything that i've talked about there is no link there is no information in the description of the video please send me a message and i'll dig it up and i'll definitely link to it uh, aside from that, we're going to begin in about 10 minutes or so. Hi, everyone. Hello, X. How are you doing? Lord, you made it. Nice. <laughs> we're just talking on YouTube. Hello. Hello, Andre. How are you doing? Uh, Ruben Steele, I think, if I got that right. Uh, hope everyone's having a good morning, afternoon, evening. 100%. Hey, Casey, how are you doing? Welcome, welcome, Malik. How are you? <laughs> Miss you during the uh, the metal, uh, the mosh pit uh, discussion with Dillinger Escape Plan, um, talking about the two people I saw in the mosh pit. I think it was you that mentioned it was Periphery that opened up for Dillinger, but I looked it up. It was uh, Darkest Hour. It was Animals as Leaders, Darkest Hour, and then it was Dillinger. Good day. Hello, T and Comics. How are you doing? All the comic book people are here, or finding their way here anyway. Spot of tea. Oh man, almost all the regulars are here. Yeah, yeah. The comic books is. Uh, we got a nice comic book crowd going, man. I hope you guys enjoy um, what we're gonna talk about today. Uh, this is something that uh, <laughs> I got into in the early '90s, and I'll try to. It, there's a lot to it. There was a lot to this, so I'll try to start in a sort of a someplace at the beginning and then we'll jump around and what i think i'm going to do i've only recently migrated to twitch it's pretty cool yeah it is pretty cool i like it i like youtube as well i very much love youtube uh, but twitch is a different feel it's like you know the, the interaction is fantastic and it really challenges you live is you know i used to watch people actors and stuff like this when they talk about if they're making recording movies tv shows or if they're doing something live and they always said oh live is different da -da 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 -da, all this jazz and i doing this now i have a sort of a feel for it so it's really cool getting that experience um, you're in for a treat johnny <laughs> hello it's my first time here johnny i just saw that welcome welcome i hope you enjoy i hope you enjoy yeah twitch is great spot of tea says you're in for a treat interesting periphery came to europe with them on the tour yeah i guess um for one or not some headliners change up uh, bands as they move around i think anyway hey how are you doing good doing good oh he's talking to spot of tea and that's uh, I, I like this thing with twitch i've noticed i noticed a fair a while ago so when people are talking to each other to put at whoever the name was so that's a great way to direct conversation i really like this interaction hello tom how are you doing wonderful timing chicho just sitting down to do some work and this will be a great listen to hope you're well as always for sure man hope the work goes well for you happy new comic book day. <laughs> happy new. i won't i won't be able to make it into the comic shop today i'll try but i have students i gotta deal with later on we're doing a live stream um, so hopefully nothing's gonna sell out by the time I get I get there I have my poll list definitely being put in but uh, 
We'll see, we'll see. Pretty good out for the comic talk. Cool, cool, cool. How are we doing for time? We're about five minutes in. And by the way, I think what I'm going to do, I'm just gonna use this camera angle. I'm not gonna switch it up. I set up this other one as well, uh, this camera angle, but the lighting is not the best. And I tried holding up the comic books to this camera angle. And it, these little cameras that I've got, they sort of uh, focus in and out. So I, because I'm gonna show you some stuff, most likely. So I'm gonna use this camera angle. And since I'm using this, there's a lot of mods on. Are you guys okay with keeping the chat going? Because comic books is about conversation as well. I, I'm, you know, I'm gonna tell you how I got into this and tell, you know, tell you about Eye for an Eye and who the creators were and stuff like this. Um, but I'm definitely cool with keeping the chat going. Um, love the alt camera. You like this one, this angle. Yeah, if you like this angle, we'll do this angle. Okay. Da, 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 da. Pretty good. Uh, some comics. I believe so as well. I like the second angle, uh, but the lighting is definitely off. Yeah, the second angle of this one, we could switch it up. We can definitely switch it up. What I could do is move this guy forward a little bit. Maybe I'll adjust. I want to make sure I'm giving myself enough room to to maneuver right i don't know if it's going to change it up much but we'll we'll do it this way i'm listening and working on something but i'll keep an eye out okay for sure I'm, hopefully i'll show you some cool stuff hopefully i won't bang this camera angle so if you guys are into it uh, we can use the other angle um up to you up to you yeah there's three mods here anyway cool so we'll keep the chat open Doing the same thing in case law. Awesome. Jack Burton, how are you doing? <laughs> Welcome back. Welcome back. Seven o'clock. Or seven minutes in. I'm gonna take well no, I'll take it off. Sort it. You'll have a full studio soon, Chicho. Yeah, maybe. It's a lot easier. Sometimes the setup for me takes a couple of hours to do for some of the streams right so there's a fair bit of work i'm doing in the background and stuff as well and then take down and then set up for the next one <laughs> i fine tuned the stuff i'm actually going to do a, uh, a a stream later on where i'm gonna i've made a sort of a list of my checklist before a live stream so i'm going to share some of the background stuff i do for anyone that does want to get into live st live streaming so they'll have a feel for what i end up doing <laughs> I got the middle finger. Check this out. What the hell? <laughs> Here, let's turn off the chat. Oh, this will disappear soon. I think messages deleted. Whoever that was, thank you. He absolutely deserves a full studio. Ah, oh, thanks, man. Thanks, Lord. <laughs> Here goes the mods. <laughs> Fun. He's gone, Chicho. Okay, sweet, sweet. Modern or escapes me. I'll keep my little clicker on the chat as well, just in case anything happens. Um, that way I can turn off the chat when we're doing a little talk. Uh, but if I'm doing it on this alternate screen, I won't be able to see the chat. That's one reason I wanted to do the main screen as well. We got your back. Awesome, awesome. Modern R escapes me sometimes. <laughs> Double Elvis, welcome. Hello, Chicho. I've missed some live streams, but now I'm back. No worries, man. I'll go through sets, right? So they'll be up on YouTube. Um, so let's see. Should we go with this camera angle? We can definitely go with this camera angle. Yeah? Is this what we're going to do? We can definitely do it. Let me turn off the chat thing. There we go. Four mods. Four mods. We've got full mods going on. So let me turn off this guy. Okay. And this angle, nah, let's keep this angle. If anything goes on, I'll keep an eye on the chat. If anything goes on, I'll try to manage the hordes, <laughs> the troll hordes, and just by clicking chat off. But you guys got my back, so that's sweet. Last time we did a comic stream, more than 50 people joined in. So four mods is not overkill, my pen. Wow, 50 people were here on a comic stream cool very cool this one people aren't gonna know about 
who I was, what I did. Some might, maybe. There's one thing I've done which should hit people's radar at some point once I start sharing the information. And this one for sure as well. So I'm gonna take off my glasses. We're about 10 minutes in. Christian, hey Chicho, missed the last few streams, been very busy, glad to be back. Welcome back, man, welcome back. Who are the regulars, by the way? I really like the vibe here. Uh, all the mods, X is regular. There's a lot of regulars here. Most of the people that popped up at the beginning right now, um, they're regulars. And yeah, I've, I'm lucky. Thank you very much. I lucked out uh, having people here that are really into this. Uh, so thank you very much, gang. Um, as far as what we're going to talk about today, okay. And since we're doing this, we've gone into sort of the story mode. For those of you who skipped over the introduction and the greetings and stuff like this, just so you know, there's gonna be anything that I try to reference, I'll, or I reference, I'll try to link up in the description of this video. If you don't see it um, coming up, if you don't see it there, please let me know and I'll try to find the links for you. And for this live stream, we're gonna keep the chat going because this is comic book, this is a conversation and uh, comic talk is amazing. So the chat will be on for this live stream, for this story session. And what we're gonna do is, um, since loading up my initial comic book videos and stuff like this, for my first video I loaded up, what I ended up doing was mentioning that I had a little stint, small, short period as a comic book publisher in the early mid 1990s. And since loading up that video and all subsequent videos for comic books, every now and then I've had people ask me what I ended up publishing, what my company was, and to share my experience with, um, you know, with comic book publishing. Okay, so I thought we'd do this live stream and at some point I'm gonna start building up this content regarding the company um, that I put together and it was called Mermaid Publications and it, we put, sort of put it together in the early 1990s, okay? And just to, I got some stuff I wanna show you here, but just to let you know what the mindset was, where I came from and why I started this thing. Basically, I had recently graduated from university with uh, my geophysics degree, majoring in geophysics, minor in mathematics, and we put out a video, uh, you know, sort of a, uh, just a discussion, just me sharing stories uh, of my geophysics life, geophysics career, basically, if you want to think about it, sort of letting you know where I came from and some of the experiences I had as a geophysicist, right? And this was sort of at the beginning stages of me becoming a geophysicist, right? So there is a video there if you want to, <laughs> that we put together is like an hour just me talking about geophysics um, will be linked up in the description of this video if you want to know what I'm talking about when I say geophysics but basically I had recently graduated from geophysics and I was lucky enough to really focus in on what I wanted to do and I was lucky enough to get a job with a multinational corporation that was just starting their geophysics department and me and another person were the first two people he was actually the first one that proposed this company geotech company started geophysics department and he hired me on as his right hand man i guess right so we started off that company doing geophysics and a year in year and a half in basically they opened up the branch in vancouver and started expanding a little bit so I was in with this company, so I had a permanent job when I needed it, so I was financially stable, okay? I was also a pretty hardcore comic book collector. I, uh, I, you know, we've put out videos where I sh I've shown you my comic book collection, and I've shown you the first, you know, the oldest comic books that I have in my collection that have stayed with me, which were the Tintin comics that we put out a video for that were in Farsi, right, that made it over the ocean with me and I've still held on to them, right? So I was into comic books when I was a kid, but I really didn't jump into the realm of comic books, collecting um, <laughs> pretty hardcore until my university life, because university was a lot of studying and a lot of just your time frame is just 
it's it's chaotic right sometimes you're pulling all nighters sometimes you're sleeping during the day sometimes you're writing multiple exams so you need a little bit of stress relief and somehow i lucked out and got into collecting comic books so towards the end of 19 1980s i was pretty hardcore collecting comic books and i was starting to amass a huge collection and i was still you know living at a university complex for student housing right i was lucky enough to get into an apartment there's three of us living in a one bedroom apartment right and slowly my comic book collection started getting bigger and bigger and the other two people left and i stayed in one that one bedroom uh school complex that we had and just comic books just took over right so what i had started doing was basically going to trade shows and selling comic books buying comic books and and whatnot right so i started off as a comic book collector and then i got into trading comic books and going to conventions and whatnot that was an amazing experience it was a lot of fun and i was sort of flipping uh comic books some comic books and then acquiring a little bit of money and buying more comic books right and basically what uh what what ended up happening to me when it came to my love of comic books and i've i've shared this information before but basically i got heavy into valiant comic books and in the 1990s there there was something magical ha happening in the comic book industry late 1980s to early 1990s there was something serious happening it was a serious shake-up happening and i looked up um some of the main independent publishers that came out through that period right i just wanted to uh put the story into context so just picture this okay dark horse comics started off in 1986 malibu comics 1986 caliber 1989 valiant comics 1989 tundra 1990 you had drawn and quarterly 1990 okay you had Image Comics 1992, Top Cow 1992, Wildstorm 1992 or 1993. And before Dark Horse, there was, you know, some minor independent comics, some bigger independent comics as well. And there was a whole bunch of independent comics that were popping up left and right in the late mid-1980s to late 1980s to early 1990s, mid-1990s the number of independent comic book publishing companies that were popping up in the industry were huge right so i was lucky enough that i was sampling a lot of comics during that period right and one of the comics that i was reading a lot i was avid like avid reader was valiant comics because while all these independent publishing companies were coming up the big two companies marvel and dc were dropping the ball there was so some kind of power struggle going on and marvel comics was just flooding the market with really 90 percent 90 90 percent of what marvel was putting out was just pure crap you know th there was some good stuff but a lot of it was brutal absolutely brutal dc comics was a little bit more better caliber comics especially when they introduced vertical comics they had sandman and hellblazer and stuff going animal man and whatnot right so dc comics still had a nice selection of comics that were very story driven okay marvel comics did a power move what they ended up doing in the early 1990s was they bought out capital distribute distributors there was basically two main distributors in the industry and there was a whole bunch of secondary distributors in the industry right there was diamond comics capital capital distributors if i'm remembering the names correctly and then there was a whole bunch of other ones 10 or 11 other more independent distributors there was sticks there was andromeda there was a whole bunch of other ones i know them because i contacted them and they were carrying the books i was publishing for a period right now while this power struggle was happening valiant comics came out in 1989 and in 1991 i believe they entered the superhero market and they were putting out comic books that were story driven right they were amazing marvel started really just flooding the market they were basically taking up about 70 percent 
65, 60 to 70 percent of shelf space, and that was their goal. They were trying to take up as much shelf space as possible to um, to basically push out the the challenge that was coming in from a lot of independent publishers. And DC was sort of trying to do the same thing, right? And Image Comics was basically most of the top or a lot of the top artists from marvel comics just taking off branching off and starting image comics and image comics when it came out there was there was serious buzz in the industry people were really excited like the energy in the comic book industry during that period was amazing right people were really psyched <laughs> just looking forward to all of these comic books coming up that weren't marvel and dc right and image had a nice initial start but it fizzled, fizzled out fairly quick because they were mainly artists they forgot to take the writers with them when they went um todd mcfarland did well with bringing in some writers to write for spawn and whatnot but basically image comics um, people were buying them but the stories were there was no story it was just art just imagery the, i remember shadowhawk reading shadowhawk it took me about <laughs> three four minutes to read the whole comic and we were like okay this is not working out so there was a handful of only a handful of publishers that were uh well not publishers it was a lot of publishers that were putting out a lot of amazing books but the shelf space being taken up in comic book stores majority of it was by comic books that didn't have a really solid story okay and for me since i was into valiant i really didn't care too much because valiant was taking off like dc and marvel were seriously being challenged during that period valiant came out of nowhere and hit number three with huge orders coming in right image comics took a huge market share away from marvel comics as well right so there was serious challenge coming up and there was a lot of money at play and one thing that happened during that period was um jim shooter that was started off and i've talked about this jim shooter when that started off valiant he got ousted from valiant comics and for me, since that was the main comic book, superhero comic book universe that I was reading, I was really bummed. I tried to stick with them, and I read some of the uh, post-Jim Shooter comics that came out, but they were nothing compared to the pre-Jim or Jim Shooter era, right? So I really, and I've mentioned this before, I, I was really upset when Valiant Comics ousted, when Jim Shooter got ousted. So what I ended up doing is pulling out of the comic book uh, collecting reading <laughs> uh, on a weekly basis right I would go to comic book stores I I I basically stopped my pull list okay I dropped all my title titles but every now and then I would go into a comic book shop and go through the back issues and buy some comics and I bought some amazing comics during the period just diving into the bins right and I would buy some comics off the racks and whatnot but I basically stopped my comic book collecting for a couple of years right after Jim Shooter got ousted especially for what was going on with Marvel and just just the chaos in the industry and the disappointment of image comics when they were putting out these comic books right and one thing that happened was that i still kept on going into comic book stores and i was doing geophysics at the time so i was in and out of town going on uh you know two week trips somewhere doing geophysics coming back and have a week off i would go you know maybe go to a comic shop go to bookstores or whatever just downtime right but what ended up happening was I was starting to make you know nice income coming in for during that period and i was missing the comic book life i was i was missing being immersed in the comic book industry so what i decided to do was um, get into the comic book game but not as a collector not as someone that was going to conventions and buying and selling comic books and trading comic books i decided to go into the comic book realm uh, re-enter the comic book industry as a publisher okay and I sort of sat down thought about this and I, I could get a loan from a bank right so I crunched some numbers and I was looking at some of the numbers that were coming out there wasn't too much information available back then you got to remember that there was internet but there was just basically e-talk like people with access uh, through universities initially that's when the internet came out or if you were sort of tech savvy and you sort of had to be tech savvy to a certain degree you got yourself a modem dialogue modem we had a computer set up at our house which was 
partition half into Linux, half into Windows 3.1, I think, or something like this, right? So we had internet at home, but there was no marketplace or anything like this. If you wanted to, um, there was a lot of forums, right? Just to let you know, there was mainly forum driven the early days of the internet which was amazing really it was it was brilliant okay so just looking at all the numbers what I ended up doing is sort of putting a little business plan together and keep in mind I had just come out of university I was doing geophysics collecting you know uh, doing contract work I worked as a geophysicist only two years of my 10-year career the rest of the time I was doing contract work I've always loved doing contract work because I can dive in and do a lot of work in one shot and take some time off right so I was doing that and my during my down period I wanted another project to occupy my time so I decided to go into the comic book industry as a publisher okay so I ran some numbers I did some calculations and because I had a job income coming in and I had a co-signer right after putting my business plan together crunching these numbers I went to the bank and got a loan I got a pretty ridiculous loan like a heavy-duty loan okay I'll leave it at that I might dive into the uh, funds aspect of it at some point but um, I ended up getting enough money to make sure that I could kick this into high gear right now what I ended up doing was the following to start off my life as a comic book publisher. Okay. And this is what I ended up doing. I called up the comic book price guys that were active at the time. Okay. There was Overstreet Pro Comic Book Price Guide. There was Wizard and there was heroes that had just recently I believe heroes was there too because I remember talking with them heroes publishing uh, comic book price guide magazine had come out as well right and I talked to the marketing department and got got them to send me quotes on what it would cost to run a full page ad in their magazines okay now I got the quotes from I believe I sh you know I have this information somewhere possibly in my boxes but I got the information from Heroes and Wizard and Overstreet Price Guide, right? Now, Heroes and Wizard were, what they wanted for a full page ad was insane, right? From what I recall, it was into the thousands of dollars, right? If you wanted to run a full page ad in Wizard Comics, Wizard Magazine at the time, I think the price for it was like $3,500 or something like this, right? And for me, that was like, ooh, that's insane. Overstreet price guide was way more reasonable. They were in the hundreds and not very high either, right? And if you got a three month, you agreed to run an ad for three months, they gave you a discount, right? So what I ended up doing was running a full page ad in the Overstreet comic book price guide. And this is the ad that I ran, okay? I believe this is the first month um, of the ad. This is uh, Overstreet comic book monthly number 10 okay and it's from February 1994 okay and Jay Lee's Jay Lee was pretty popular back then uh, his artwork and stuff okay so I ran a full page ad in this and this is the ad that I read and please keep in mind technology was not where it is now right when I was doing geophysics when I was collecting data we would sort our data and when we needed to do a little bit of creating process the data and stuff like this we used to set everything up and press the enter button on Friday and then check up on the algorithm on the processing on the computer just to make sure it didn't crash over the weekend so we'd go into the office and just check to make sure the computer is still running and then on Monday we would have our data right right now with the technology available you could do that and the computer would be done within a couple of minutes right just to give you an idea to be able to start this company to be able to do what i needed to do the hardware that i needed to buy the cost on it was insane the first laser printer that i bought okay was in 1993 or something it was a uh, more higher end because i was printing a lot of stuff 
it cost me two thousand dollars and a scanner at the time there were new technology and a scanner flatbed scanner that would cost you right now maybe forty dollars fifty dollars i paid eighteen hundred dollars for or so okay fifteen or eighteen hundred dollars that's how much tech cost and computer processing speed was ridiculously slow so working in photoshop or anything like this was <laughs> i i didn't have the the knowledge or the computing power to do it right and this is the full page ad that i ran in overstreet comic book price guy right mermaids 1994 comic book contest <laughs> okay and this thing gets distributed around the globe i know this because i had people contact me from australia and different places in the world in europe as well okay so let me just read you what i wrote here okay and this is graphic i was not a graph i was a graphics person when it came to i did a little bit of putting maps together presenting my data for geophysics writing reports and stuff like this but when it came to design stuff like this you know i hadn't done publishing before <laughs> this was my sort of first thing and another thing you should keep in mind this wasn't chicho right now this was chicho in his early 20s right i was what's the terminology green blue i was new into the world right so this is what i ran mermaid's 1994 comic book contest art artists writers right do you want to become a professional in the comics industry do you feel you have created a world so different that it must have a place in the comic book universe in short do you want your own monthly title this is your chance of a lifetime mermaid, mermaid publications <laughs> mermaid publications invites you to enter our Nash nationwide contest we are seeking comic book creators to join our expanding company the winners will be offered contracts to produce monthly titles based on their creations entries may consist of stories and or character portfolios the 10 winning stories and portfolios will be published in our summer 1994 annual okay that didn't come out it was i was dreaming to put, putting this out uh, in february 1994 and putting out a book in summer of 1994 that would have been earliest summer of 1995 okay only entrance of stories will be eligible for the 10 contracts cash prizes will be awarded to three outstanding entries in each category stories must be black and white um, <laughs> stories must be, i guess i should have said the art must be black and white because i did pricing i contacted Quebecor in uh, montreal quebec they were doing a huge percentage of the printing of comic books both both for marvel and dc and a lot of other comic book companies okay stories must be black and white and may not exceed 20 pages portfolio may be black and white or color and must consist of character sketches and biographies processing fee is 25 dollars for stories and 10 10 dollars for portfolios right so i ended up putting a cost on this because i didn't want it was twofold i didn't want just you know things paced together to be sent to me i didn't want to be overwhelmed I wanted people to think about this if they were going to put funds to a company their entries and my idea at the time was if i got a fair bit of entries at least some of that cost would go towards publishing this annual that we were planning on publishing right and the rest of this is just a p.o box and whatnot right and i have a little disclaimer here i'm not sure what i put down there uh, this contest is not open to employees i basically for these all these little fine prints of things that i that i put together i would look on other people's um other companies publishing stuff that they had and i would just basically reword them or use their words and stuff like this because this was legal stuff i didn't know legal stuff even though i had hired a lawyer and accountant and got the company incorporated um, I believe the company was incorporated or in the process of being incorporated when I put this ad out, right? So there was a little bit of cost in the background that I was doing just to make sure I was doing this right because I've never done this before, right? I was in my early 20s doing geophysics just out of university a couple of years, right? So what I ended up writing down was this contest is not open to employees of Mermaid Publications 
or their immediate families, name, address, phone number, and full processing fee must accompany each entry. Entries are non-returnable and become the property of Mermaid Publications. We are not responsible for loss, damage, or late entries. We reserve the right to increase or decrease the number of contracts offered according to the quality of the entries received. Judges' decisions are final. Another thing I should have entered here as well in the disclaimer um, or in the in the not in the fine print I should have put it here I should have told people not to send their original art because I had people sending me original art so I was sitting there going man these people send me original art uh, like I couldn't return everything because it didn't like it it would have been ridiculous it would have cost me a lot of money to return everything and you know some of the original art wasn't up to snuff like i wasn't gonna pick up those contracts right so i felt a little bit bad for people sending me original art so if you're planning on sending anything to a publishing company don't send originals please please don't send originals um because they won't be returned to you uh, I don't think they return them to you, okay? So that was basically the advertisement that I ran in Overstreet Price Guide for three months, right? And slowly what happened was I started, you know, I wasn't sure what was going to happen, right? I, I got a 800 number uh, where people could call me up, and I basically... Uh, did research in the background I was still doing geophysics and when I was out of town I was out of town when I was in town I would just work on this and read and do research and do whatever I could right to to prepare myself for what was happening and I was I was so excited when I was I would get packages coming in I had a PO box number so I would get packages coming in. I would open them up and read the the stories being shared what people wanted to what people wanted to create right and the main reason for me doing this um, one of the main reasons I did this was because I wanted to get back into the comic book industry right the other main reason was I knew there's amazing stories to be told like I was lucky enough going to conventions and just being in the comic book industry just as a collector and doing trade shows and stuff I met a lot of artists and creators and there was amazing stuff that people ideas that people had and it was amazing work that I had already seen right so because of Jim Shooter being ousted with Valiant Comics because of all the just the influx of just companies trying to you know this power struggle going on trying to take up more shelf space and the quality of the comics dropping in a big way in a big way not all of them again not all of them there were some amazing gems coming out during that period a lot of amazing independence a lot of amazing stories being told but the mainstream stuff coming out the stuff was not up to par it wasn't i wasn't interested in reading them right so that was one of the other reasons that i started mermaid was because i wanted to read amazing comic book stories and i knew they were out there right and this was me sort of dipping my feet and trying to get a feel for what was going on okay so i started getting stuff coming in started coming in slowly and i guess uh you know people seeing the ad running for three consecutive months had more faith and started sort of a stream of entrance started coming in right and the comic book that I'm going to show you, that I'm going to tell you the little story about the creators of this comic book, or the creator of this comic book, and his crew, and his gang, and his, and his friends, right, was one of the comic books that came to me. I'm not sure if it came to me at the beginning or in the middle towards the end. I'm pretty sure it was one of the earlier entrance packages I got, because as soon as I saw it, I knew I was going to publish this thing, right? And for me, what I... You know, one bit of advice I can I can give you is, if you set your mind to something, if you've taken on a project, and you've made certain promises, try your best to fulfill these promises. And that's was my experience with Mermaid Publications because I learned a lot. I made some amazing connections, some amazing friends, and 
once I had decided to do this, I knew I was going to at least burn through all the money that I had <laughs> borrowed from the bank, right? And one of the first entrants that I got, and I didn't bring any of the original art stuff to show you, they're in boxes somewhere and I'll, I'll have to get to them, right? So I only brought you, I, only, I ended up publishing three issues of the series and I have the fourth one, the original art for the fourth one as well, but I went, I went bankrupt. I, I ran out of money. Not I didn't declare bankruptcy, but I, I ran out of money. I couldn't print anymore. And I'll I'll give you the explanation, uh, or the my well, it's not an excuse, but the reasons why. After I show you the comic books, what happened with the distributor wars kicking in? By the time we had gotten ready to go to print to send the books out, right? So this is issue number one, and this came out in, let me put on my glasses, I believe it came out in January 1995, right? So I ran the ad in Overstreet Comic Book Price Guys in February 94, right? And it ran for three months, and by January 1995, right, I had this out. And what I had planned on doing was releasing three titles the first month i wanted to um and at the time i believe when i was doing this i was the largest uh superhero canadian comic book publisher not by quantity of comics because we only ended up printing two thousand issues of this okay of each one of these issue number one two and three right but in terms of titles right because i was trying to release three titles at a time now at the time i think i fulfilled that criteria but i'm not 100 percent sure i haven't looked back into the history and again there wasn't the internet that it is right now the the information you could gather you had to go to the library to get some information or go talk to comic shop owners or make phone calls and stuff like this so data was not readily available but as far as i know at the time i became the largest superhero comic book publisher in canada in terms of titles being put out and that's what i was going for right to sort of enter the industry with a bang right so i published this one i for an eye number one and i won't let you know not yet what the other titles were or should i let you know do we, do we want to know what they were they were <laughs> i have a little newsletter here that i uh, i put together right that i was sending out to comic book stores and i was contacting comic book stores directly um i put out basically five different titles okay and the first three were eye for an eye which is this one starry night and i'll show you that one at some point and go go boy okay and those were the first three titles that i ended up publishing and um they all, they all started off with issue number one. They all started off, I believe, yeah, they, they did, January 1995, okay? And they all had 2000, and 2000 print run, okay? So this was issue number one. Let me show you some of the artwork on it too, right? And the gang here, this group, the main creator of this was Gil Garcia. Let me show you this. This is him, okay? And these guys were out of Denver, Colorado, okay? And uh, basically, um, Denver and uh, what's the sister city? Um, oh, man, I forget. Boulder. Boulder, I had another comic book title coming that came to me later on that I published from Boulder, Colorado. And these guys were out of Denver, okay? And uh, I believe they were out of Denver anyway. And Gil Garcia was the guy that came up with this concept. And he was young. He was like early 20s. He was younger than me, right? And he had a nice crew working with him, okay? He had an amazing set of friends, and I met them. I went to Denver and met them. And I had a booth as Mermaid Publications in San Diego Comic Con in uh, summer of 1995. I believe it should, it should have been summer of 1995. We had a booth at the San Diego Comic Con. And what I ended up doing was I offered to bring in 
um, all the artists that I was publishing. So I ended up uh, paying for hotel rooms of everybody coming in and uh, me and the artist, the creator of Go Go Boy from Vancouver, who's from Vancouver, we flew over to Denver and we rented a car. So I was covering all the costs of all the artists and writers that came to the convention and stuff like this. And we actually ended up going to Seattle um, with the crew, with not all of them. Um, I believe uh, Gil, yeah, uh, Gil was there, uh, Go Go Boy and another, uh, basically it was three of us there at uh, for Dave Sims independent comic show that he did I believe in 1995 as well 1995 or 1996 okay and for this first issue I basically put out a little you know a little thing here that I wrote down sort of welcome to welcome to the world of mermaid publications and at the bottom here Gil put out something a little note you know giving a thank you to the people that he wanted to sort of uh, give credit to okay so let me read you this thank you just for you to have a feel for who these people were who this crew was okay so and Gil would like to say this, this is what we said extra thanks to and I'll call myself Chicho so he, he basically said extra thanks to Chicho and the crew for incredible patience and faith and for this opportunity my mother and father for everything, my sister for incredible support, my true friends who've always been there through thicker, thick and thin. I'll pay you back someday, and I love you all. You know who you are. Bruce and Sparks and Bruce's Comics for being way cool. The Center for Contemporary Arts and Santa Fe, um, Chrissy, Chrissy, Anna, and the crew. Um, logical nonsense. Yeah, that's what he put down. Yeah. And then he also said thanks in another paragraph. Thanks, Tom Chicago, Levy Jackson, Sepatura, Fear Factory, Slayer, Jamalski, Public Enemy, Alka Skates, Colorado Institute of Arts, Denver, New York City, Chicago, Oakland, Denver, Santa Fe, Phoenix crew, you rule. And among all, God, for everything that is good, just and right. If I forgot someone, let let us know and we'll shoot shoot one out to you next thanks for f picking this shit up and pass the word later now this is sort of on the theme of the metal that we've been talking about in a couple of previous streams anyway gil and his gang okay i call them basically my definition my issue number one right let me show you this issue number one issue number two and if you notice in the background there's people hanging and they're cops right and issue number three okay now these guys i i would tell people that the guys putting this together they're basically a bunch of skater thrashers thrash metal and they're basically a gang of skate skateboarders and Hispanic gang of skateboarders and thrash music metal music they had a metal band okay that they did tours with and they sent me one of their t-shirts and I still have this t-shirt so let me show you this t-shirt okay and I gotta retire this t-shirt you you guys would have seen this t-shirt uh, in some of the math videos that I've put out okay this is their band it was called Los Terribles this is their logo on the front okay Los Terribles is a black shirt and this was their logo okay. and I think one of the albums they put out was Kill the Tacos or something like this and they were a huge Slayer fan and they knew I was sort of metal fan and um, they're the ones that actually turned me on to Slayer right so they were they were phenomenal phenomenal group of people right the package that they sent me was incredible for me to pick them up to publish them right they had a lot of pages outlined they had a world that they wanted to share okay and when I say they're, they're a Hispanic gang out of Denver that were making thrash music and they had their own band they did a tour and they were very 
uh, they were gun advocates. When I went to Denver uh, for one of the comic book shows, they took me to a gun show. Right, my first time, my only time that I've ever gone to a gun show. You know, we met up during a comic book convention and we had a booth there. It was just a local comic book convention, right? Um, but because they were from there and there was a, another group of people that I'll let you know about that I was publishing uh, from there. Um, you know, we met up at the comic book show. They were doing signings and stuff like this. And basically, there was a gun show happening in town. So they took me to a gun show. They they basically uh, offered to take me to the gun range because they were serious gun advocates, right? They, they offered to take me to a gun, aim, gun range to shoot the machine guns that they had, right? And they were like in their 20s, like early 20s. There were a couple of them that were like 18, 19 years old, right? Gil was around 21 or 20 years old then, right? And these guys, they didn't do any drugs. They didn't drink. They were straight up hardcore skateboarders into thrash metal music okay played their music did their work did their art and they had a tight group of friends together okay Gil did the pencils the layouts and stuff like this he did some of the inking there were other people doing some of the inking they had a friend doing the lettering this is the first page of this and we'll at some point I'm gonna read all three of these comics to you guys we might do them live i tried to set up with these cameras that i have but they're not strong enough they're focusing in and out so i have to get a better camera system set up for me to be able to read this to you live so we might do these recorded but this was the first page right that they did it's nice just sharp line work and their art varies by each issue okay they were experimenting here's issue number here's just the next side of it right let me zoom into this so you get a feel for it oh yeah and they used to go out and do graffiti hardcore murals and graffiti and tagging all over the place okay and they loved they loved like just here corrupt government suck say no to crooked cops vote with a bullet logical was too logical was on tour okay Hazardous, hazardous graffiti was this is part one of the issue right the artwork is absolutely amazing okay so basically they sent me this was what they sent me the, they didn't send me the originals they just sent me uh, copies and then you know just a few pages and Gil had explained to me you know the story the universe that we're creating and this was sort of in into the near future it was actually late 1990s the time frame on this where the United States had sort of partitioned and um, it, it was sort of a it wasn't post apocalyptic but it was sort of sci-fi feel with a little bit of tech okay and a lot of chaos and sort of balkanization of the United States if you know political terms and whatnot right so I contacted them and they, I said, look, I'd love to print, you know, publish you guys. I'd love to print your comic books. Do you have enough material? Or can you put this out on a monthly basis if we're going to do the monthly basis, right? And he basically told me, yep, he would be, they would be able to do it on a monthly basis, okay? And they were going to hop on it right away if I gave the go-ahead, okay? And I gave the go-ahead and they started working on it. And they, they were bang on. They were some of the artists that I work with, some of the creators that I work with, that they delivered, right? I contacted some people. What I found out in, with the comic book industry was with artists and stuff like this was um, a lot of people talked big, but very few people delivered. So when I was going through the submissions of people sending me material, what I really paid attention to was if they could deliver, right? I looked at the, the universe that they had created. I looked at the artwork that they were sending me. I looked at their, the way they presented themselves to see if they were legit or they were just, you know, hoping to be published somewhere, right? And I was lucky. The first three titles that I picked 
they were all different this is this being one of them and they all delivered so i felt an obligation to make sure that i would deliver as well okay and this was sort of the last page of issue number one okay thumb. and here let me show you this guy too so this is these are the titles that i was you know five titles that i was planning on releasing i ended up releasing this is i for night number two i go go boy number two starry night number two mortal coil number one and impulse number one i was able to get up to i for night number three go go boy number three starry night number three mortal coil number two and there was another comic book that we published two issues of but i never got impulse out okay we ran out of money we couldn't do it okay and the design that you see here take a look at this right I know it's not focusing well that design right there we turned that into a t-shirt so let me show you the t-shirt and I printed a few for you of these t-shirts and this is I've retired this one I wore this one a lot okay this was eye for an eye okay <laughs> graffiti style and this is the design we had on the back and I wore this around in the 90s so much. This was one of my favorite t-shirts. And I had a handful of these and I wore them all down. I think I have one in a box that I didn't wear. I wanted I wanted to keep or I wore a little bit. Okay. Beautiful, beautiful artwork. Right? Beautiful design. I love their style. They had a max sort of um, Max Sam Keith feel to it, but more raw to a certain degree. And let me show you issue number two and issue number three. And here's issue number two, the cover of issue number two. Okay. And just to let you know, let me, let me, before we get into issue number two, let me tell you what happened with the distributing stuff. So what I ended up doing was because I had, you know, I contacted people, I, uh, I decided to go with these first three comic titles first eye for an eye starry night and gogo -Go boy and while well, mortal coil i didn't decide to go with until later okay it was basically a couple of months later we decided two or three months later we decided to go with mortal coil but what i ended up doing is putting out an ash can during the 90s ash cans were pretty popular so we um actually before the ash can what i ended up doing was this I basically took the art copies of this right issue number one completed right for eye for an eye for Google Go boy and starry night right and I packaged that stuff up and I sent it out to the distributors and at the time there was like 12 distributors that I contacted one of them was um, diamond distributors one of them was capital distributors one of them was sticks one of them was Andromeda and there was a eight more at least that I sent the samples to solicitation to so they would be solicited for the january um, 1995 release so i was i was trying to do this el rapido right i was trying to do this fairly fast speedy gonzalez style because i wanted to get out there i was excited i had taken out a loan so there was interest accumulating right so once i took out a loan initially i took out a little bit of loan to uh, run the ads and get the equipment and stuff like this but once i decided to go full load with this i went back for the top up okay and the top up was huge i was paying back this loan for 10 years right it ended up costing me just to let you know i mean i was a young kid didn't really understand how the current distribution monopoly system capitalism works i this whole thing endeavor basically ended up costing me over a hundred thousand dollars right over the 10-year period where i was paying back this loan okay but i tried my best man and i'll i'll let you know why it ended up costing me so much right so issue number one of i for an eye google Go boy and starry night i packaged up send it to all the distributors saying we want solicita solicitation for the mag the distributor catalogs came out i think three months before you know the when the comic books were going to hit the stands right all the distributors 
accepted the titles, agreed to list them, except for diamond distributors. Okay. Now, you can be the judge if, if this comic book, basically the reason they told me that they didn't like, they, didn't, they weren't going to list this was because they didn't think it was good enough to be listed in their catalog right the lettering for this is some of the best lettering i've seen in any comic books okay absolutely beautiful beautiful artwork very unique it's got its own style and these guys were hardcore graffiti artists like seriously they've tagged I've talked with them uh, wherever they went on tour with their metal band thrash band they went out and tagged and graffiti right so they were pretty dedicated graffiti artists so diamond distributors decided not to carry this now my timing to do this thing was pretty horrendous to enter the publishing industry <laughs> comic book publishing industry because at the time when i contacted the distributors and went with the print runs and had three months already planned out right because we had to at the time basically what you needed to do was i had to take each one of these pages and get them photographed professionally and then send them over to get plates made up so the cost was huge and some of these designs i i had to hire someone who was professional enough in graphic design to be able to put these pages together i could do it now but back then i didn't have the computing power i didn't have the know-how and whatnot so it cost a fair bit of money the production cost was huge on the back end of this right so i had already committed to this and I had promised these artists these creators that was going to publish their books and at the time what was happening was basically the the distribution the comic industry was going through a serious flux marvel comics had bought up capital right so capital distributor was only going to be distributing marvel comics there was exclusively contracts being signed with distributors and by the time we went to print we did all three issues with these with all the all the distributors but all the distributors by the time mid 1990s rolled around 1996 all the distributors basically were bankrupt right so any books that the other the the secondary distributors had ordered from us we never got paid from them either right so all of a sudden there wasn't no money coming in and diamond distributors had decided not to carry our books right so that was my first initial experience as a gatekeeper as not as a gatekeeper as being affected by gatekeepers preventing you from contacting your audience right so what i ended up doing was i tracked down the name and addresses of comic book stores in canada in the united states right i got it from the library i got some stuff from the internet and whatnot so i compiled a database of comic book stores in canada and united states and what i ended up doing was sending them out okay the cost for this was insane what i did was crazy right i sent one but i you know i wasn't going to take a no for an answer i couldn't believe diamond distributors was not going to carry these books right so i sent them out a newsletter i sent them out samples of the work I printed I went to the printers and I printed off an ash can issue with two ash cans one of them was mortal coil with the flip side being I believe it was eye for an eye another one was an ash can of gogo -Go boy okay with the flip side being mortal coil I believe okay because what had happened a couple of months in I kept on resending like issue number one diamond distributor said no issue number two they said no issue number three they said no by issue number two i realized i had to pick up something 
And let me show you the artwork for issue number two. Okay. So Diamond Distributor said no to this one as well. Okay. And as you can tell, the artwork is a little bit different. I like the issue number two artwork. I really do. It's beautiful. Okay. So by issue number two, I realized what Diamond Distributors basically wanted, which was your generic superhero type of comic book with big muscles and whatnot. And that was the main reason I published Mortal Coil. Okay. I mean, look at this panel. That looks beautiful, right? It's like Sam Keith and uh, Frank Miller type of artwork, right? So I contacted, uh, you know, I kept on sending these issues in and Diamond kept on saying no, right? So I printed off, you know, ash cans, 2,000 of Mortal Coal ash cans, 2,000 of Gogo Boy ash cans, and I put together packages of, I don't know how many packages, I sent out it would have been over a thousand into the hundreds maybe a little bit less than a thousand comic shop stores that I ended up finding take a look at this and I mean look at that panel And what I ended up doing, I created my own order forms, right? So I had my own order form in there, newsletter, other information, thank yous, original art giveaway contest. Basically, I was doing what Valiant was doing with comic book stores, but little old me, right? With these comic books that I was publishing. And I sent them out. I had a comic, couple of comic book stores contact me. Okay. But during that time, basically in the United States, I believe the numbers were, there were like 3,000 comic book stores in the United States. And by the end of the 1990s, that number had dwindled down to, I think, a 1,000 maybe like comic book stores basically went out of bankrupt the industry was going through was going through some serious turbulent times right here's the artwork for starry night and she was amazing this was a female creator Lori Saltz was the creator for this and she did the artwork and the story this was post-apocalyptic and I love post-apocalyptic and her style was very much Sam Keith style of artwork and she did a beautiful work beautiful work and then I had a I was running a 1995 comic book contest and I was giving away original art okay and here's a little promo piece we had for impulse that we never got to so basically diamond said no no we're not gonna carry it I tried to uh, get them to carry it but it didn't happen and one of the reasons um, you diamond distributors decided my understanding was decided not to carry our titles which was sort of a mistake on my part to a certain degree i should have approached them with eye for an eye first starry night and then go go boy okay the reason being was um here let me show you this too this is the crew gill's crew this is issue number three okay and I had mature readers put on here because they were swearing and there was a lot of violence. So I didn't want to get, you know, I wanted to be honest with people. I didn't want people surprise people with anything, right? Parental advisory, explicit content, right? They put their thing on there. And here's uh, Gil's crew, okay? Story and Inks, Gil Garcia, pencils, 
Kaistiki. So he was, they brought in another artist. So he had a nice network, right? If we were able to continue this, these guys would have stuck with this for so long, for so long. They loved doing this. They were passionate about this, right? Lettering, Andre, Tribolt, Tribolt, Breakdowns, Richard Vegas, and I met all these people. And the computer graphics was th th synthesized design. And that was one of the people in his group, in his gang, in his band, and the people that they went out skating and tagging graffiti with, right? And check out the lettering for this. The lettering for this issue is absolutely beautiful, right? That's the first page. Apologies about the camera, it's not zooming in nicely. Right? So it was different type of style of art. Very unique on its own. Take a look at this. Right? Beautiful character development. Okay, you liked, and by the way, the story, the characters here, it's them. The names, the people, it's them. The main, one of the main characters is Gil. Okay, he got, he has his brother in there. So these guys put their heart and soul into it, and I put everything I, I could into it, really. I really did. <laughs> Check out this. <laughs> Kill the tacos. Right. Kill the tacos. Boom. Boom. <laughs> Check this out. They're looking down at the girl that just got shot. Right? So, for me, there was, you know, obviously I was young, I was making mistakes and stuff like this. But one of the biggest mistakes uh, in regards to getting distribution set up with Diamond Distributors was I didn't realize how much of a monopoly control they had, how much of a sort of a old boys club the comic book industry was. Those in power did not like not, you know, losing power. Those in power did not like... Uh, anything that was different than what they were used to especially in regards to different mindset um, and just to let you know um, this was I published a whole bunch of different comic books I wanted diversity I knew there was stuff out there that was not being presented in comic book form in Canada and United States anyway. So, you know, I tried my best to get this out, to get it out to where it was going to be distributed. Once Diamond Distributors rejected this eye for an eye, I started contacting skate shops, skateboard shops directly. So along with comic book stores that I sent packages to, like a thousand of them or something, right? As many as I could find, put the database together. A whole bunch of them came back to me, right? By the time the stuff got out, you know, the comic books had moved and stuff like this, so they were returned to me. I also, what I also ended up doing, which was amazing experience, right? Now that I think back at it, look back at it, I don't know if any of you guys are into skateboarding, but there was a sort of a festival happening, not a festival, but sort of a circuit that happens called Slam City Jam, right? So what I tried to do was um, get into uh, the skate community right off the bat with eye for an eye as soon as I realized I couldn't get into the comic book stores because the only comic the only comic book distributor that was left was diamond distributors and they rejected the comic so I couldn't get into the comic book stores directly I didn't really get a huge reply from the mail outs that I did right it was pathetic I had some people actually send me checks to have yearly subscriptions for eye for an eye and I still have some of those checks once I realized that 
there's no way I could continue. I didn't bother cashing those checks. I didn't want to burn people, right? But one thing I ended up doing was setting up a booth at Slam City Jam. It's sort of a skateboard contest event that happens or used to happen anyway once a year or once every once a year i believe back then in vancouver and we had set up a i basically took a primo spot right i i took the most expensive booth that they had that was basically in front of the half half pipe where people could wash the half pipe there was a band playing and then the half pipe was in front of it and the whole crowd was around and it was basically right in the corner right so i set up a booth i had my t-shirt set up i had some people buy some t-shirts a couple of people buy comic books you know it wasn't a comic book shop people were like oh this is cool this is cool but a lot of skaters don't have the money right uh they're flying on fumes so it was very interesting experience i remember just sitting there watching this whole event happen and i wasn't into the skateboard scene then right this was something new to me but you know i had to do my best to get the get this out as to as many places as i could right but i remember sitting there at the booth um and they had the half pipe competition going it was a finals it was a weekend or three-day event going on and it was a finals happening and limp biscuit i believe or slip who was i think it was limp biscuit or slipknot i can't believe remember who it was they were playing and then so just imagine they're playing here the half pipe is going like this and i'm sitting right here watching the whole thing happen with the crowd going crazy right so it was absolutely an amazing experience an amazing experience um and it was brilliant and these these guys i don't know where they are now i lost track of them we kept in touch a while longer a few years later um after stopping the publishing the printing of the comic books but we lost touch like 20 years ago or so uh, so hopefully maybe if they end up seeing this and when i do the readings of these comics hopefully it'll make their radar and uh, maybe they send me a little note saying hey chicho let's do issue number four or something and if i get enough funds i'll definitely print issue number four of eye for an eye that's for sure that's for sure right um but that's basically eye for an eye just a sort of a little intro to it and at some point i will definitely read these comics to you guys and i will definitely go over um and let me tell you let me tell you what the the background what the story was for the other comic books mortal coil was basically just your generic superhero comic book title that came out in the 1990s that's what diamond accepted that's the only title that diamond actually the other they accepted another one afterwards too but mortal coil was the first one they accepted because it was very generic superhero and uh, uh i mean the artists the writers for that comic book really didn't deliver for issue number two because i had solicited i had to do some of the inking on it and some of the lettering on it and i'm not an artist so i wasn't happy with mortal coil personally number one came out beautiful uh, it's nice beautiful artwork the art the artist for this was awesome but what ended up happening is i couldn't talk to him directly anymore before even number one came out his father got involved and they took control of his everything and they got a lawyer so the lawyer it was very weird and i was like i wasn't going to deal with it right i like dealing with independence not <laughs> not lawyers right um so mortal coil was your generic superhero team comic book i published another title which was called lander and the writer for that was had a christian uh background born again christian background so there was a christian overtone to the book sort of a, a moses type of story but modern day post-apocalyptic from the united states with this hero coming up and he, there was no superpowers with this sort of a a renegade coming up sort of a mad max feel but with a uh, moses and with a tribe taking a tribe of people across the desert it was, it was a cool story and we printed uh, some issues of that and diamond ended up carrying that as well but the industry was taking a die by that time starry night was basically basically a post-apocalyptic story of just this character it was beautiful like it just it was deep 
the the words for it and it was sort of a uh, analysis of our world it was very good i loved starry night and i loved uh, talking with the creator of starry night which was laurie saltz eye for an eye this was sort of my mature readers thrasher metal skateboarder comic book which i loved right doing i loved all of them mortal coil was a necessity De doing a deal with the devil to try to get into diamond distributors and then slowly introduce the rest of the stuff which they still didn't accept right and gogo -Go boy um i wasn't really going to get into gogo -Go boy but let me tell you what gogo -Go boy was and i'll do an intro legit intro for gogo -Go boy um, when we do gogo -Go boy when i let you know what it was but basically when i was getting the all this material coming in i for an eye was one of the first ones i got starry night was one of the first ones that i got as well and i'm pretty sure and i decided to go with those two right off the bat there was a couple of one, other ones i was talking with the artists and the creators and stuff like this but they were iffy they were you know sometimes they sent material sometimes they didn't send material so anyone that i couldn't um rely on because i was putting a lot of funds into this like really i couldn't take risk on anyone not delivering right so slowly things started filtering you know filtering out i had eye for an eye i had starry night going mortal coil i think towards the end i might have started talking with i don't think so i think it was later on i think it was the 1995 comic book contest that i ran uh, believe so anyway okay i'll have to look check my notes and stuff like this if i can if i have them still but another package that i got and i had a deadline for the 1994 comic book contest right and i got another package at the end date the last week the last few days of the contest ending right and it was a package that was the artwork was very rough very rough right the story was laid out the letter that the person sent me was authentic like the guy his name was neil johnson and he wrote it out saying listen i know i'm really late for this i hope i didn't miss it i just saw this comic book contest i really want to get this published and stuff like this and the thing that he did was he had a little comic strip running in a newspaper in a university newspaper at sfu university in vancouver so there was a paper that was running his comic strip and it was just you know a straight up comic strip just you know three panels or you know going across like this sometimes just just one panel and i think they had ran this for a few months so he said he could meet deadlines because he'd been doing this for a few months i think it was a weekly paper maybe or bi-weekly paper and so that built trust that he could deliver he was from vancouver so i could meet up with him in person and he was the only person from vancouver that contacted me that i had an interest in to publish his work and the other reason i picked it up and this took some serious contemplating on my part I really took a risk with this I'm glad I did but one of the reasons that I believe that diamond comic distributors didn't pick up these titles and I can't like seriously diamond was distributing I bought comic books that had horrendous art like this art would blow away some of the comic books that I've bought that I love some of them like really uh, so the mistake i made with diamond distributors was sent out eye for an eye starry night and gogo -Go boy together in one shot because gogo -Go boy's art wasn't up to snuff but it, the story was important and it was important to be for me anyway just being a collector i knew it was important to be the first on the market okay and the one thing that gogo -Go boy offered that was not present in the comic book industry was Google -Go boy was the first monthly comic book series to feature lgbt 
gay characters as superheroes and supervillains all out full out okay and this was my first exposure to this realm and i thought about this i thought about this i thought about this for many days many days and i talked to a friend and i sort of said listen man comic books are censored comic books are controlled um you know it was a big deal and this was basically a year a year or two years after north star from alpha flight secondary character came out as gay in marvel comics right so that was a huge deal it was alpha flight 106 or something like this right so that was a huge deal oh my god there's a gay character right so i was like man i have no idea how the industry is gonna handle a full-on lgbt monthly superhero comic book series i said man there isn't anything like this out there right and this friend of mine turned to me and said look man if there isn't if it's not out there then maybe you being the first would be good there's a market out there for it right so i sort of said okay let's give it a try right so i i went with gogo boy as well and when diamond comic distributors decided not to carry these titles uh, the other thing that i did was not only contact skateboard skate shops for i4 and i i also gathered the database for basically queer uh, lgbt gay bookstores in canada and united states and i sent them packages as well right and the reception for google boy was insane the gay community loved it i realized how what i had stumbled onto when in vancouver okay at the time um, the rave the underground electronic music scene was huge in the late 80s and early 90s mid 1990s was huge there was a lot of warehouse underground music happening right warehouse parties illegal warehouse parties and there was one happening and the and it, a huge chunk of it came out from the gay community and the gay community in vancouver is huge and they had the in to the music scene right and the creator of gogo boy i know we're talking about i for an eye but we'll talk about gogo boy as well the creator of gogo boy he was he knew the community right and he talked to some of these people and they knew this book was coming out because i had gone to the comic book stores and they 50 percent of the gay comic book stores i contacted they wanted to carry gogo boy right they ordered gogo boy right there wasn't that many of them like you know i had to do hardcore research to find a couple of dozen right and send out those packages as well because i didn't know you know how that was going to play out the rave scene uh, in vancouver they threw a party where they had huge banners of gogo -Go boy on the walls and i went this was my first time going into any type of electronic music scene like this in a warehouse right underground warehouse and it was huge we entered through multiple channels went in there and i went up there and it was gigantic walls with gigantic google boy banners and the place was there was i don't know two three four hundred people in this place just bopping and i was like <laughs> out of university doing geophysics trying to publish comic books and trying to promote gogo -Go boy and i for an eye in the skateboard community and the gay community with go 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 boy i couldn't believe what was happening right we had i had icon magazine i had two major national and international magazine do interviews with us we had radio interviews with gogo -Go boy i had a gay club in denver colorado throw a party for gogo -Go boy where we held a held the a costume contest and we said we would uh, introduce people came up with their own costumes with their own heroes and villains dressed up and there was a sort of a runway contest where <laughs> where where people dressed up in the costume and the queen uh drag queen of the ceremonies read out what 
who this character was and what their powers were, right? And we have, you know, a splash page of that done in one of the in Go Go Boy number three and stuff like this, right? So that's sort of my story with Mermaid Publications and my story with Eye for an Eye comic book. Uh, mainly focus on Eye for an Eye comic book and a little bit of Go Go Boy and some of the other ones. And at some point, we'll definitely read these, okay? I just wanted to share this because I've had a lot of people ask me what my experience was this uh, publishing comic books. And it was amazing. It was amazing. It cost me a lot of money. It took me a lot of geophysics to pay, pay back those debts and a lot of investing and flipping, selling some of my collection to pay back some of that debt. But uh, it was an experience I wouldn't trade for the world. I learned about the comic book industry how it's controlled, how it functions. I lo learned about distribution, right? I learned about censorship. I learned about gatekeepers. I learned about the gang that put together Eye for an Eye, what a legit group they were, what an amazing bunch of people they were that you can be in metal and thrash and be a gun advocate and go out and do graffiti and tagging and skateboarding and be totally 100% clean, right? I learned about the LGBT community, the universe and what is introduced to the world and how receptive they are uh, to outsiders that are open-minded. It was incredible, it was incredible, right? It was a fantastic experience, okay? And that was Mermaid Publications. And at some point, I'll definitely share um, a lot more about what I ended up doing, okay? And we'll uh, sort of leave it there. Um, I think there's some comments, some chat going along. So what I'm going to end up doing is ending the stream. And um, within a couple of minutes, I'm just going to read some of the some of the chat some of the comments and then we'll start this up again and uh, sort of do a post mermaid publications eye for an eye stream and just touch base with everyone uh, that's what we've been doing for these story sessions for this set okay aside from that uh, thank you for listening thank you for watching i hope you enjoyed and uh, i'll definitely see you in the next uh, video or next stream bye for now